right? Uh, 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 it's, um, it's, um, it's there. <laughs> it's there. Um, it's your choice. That's the last part of it, <laughs> right? Uh, um, st- stress, faith, or fear, it's your choice. Right? And uh, I've been going through it. I've been going through it, and it's been my choice to believe God. Right? And again, I want to thank everybody here for that. Amen? So, we are in a series. Hopefully it's coming to a close. All right? Life has a way of making us question our worth. We look at our bank account, what do you feel like when it's zero? You lose your job, what do you feel like when you get a pink slip? You have contention with everybody around you, what do you feel like? It makes us question our value. And life is designed to do that. All right? And when we question our worth, we start looking for validations. Our validations come from money. Amen. You got a, a, a fat bank account, you feel good about yourself. Our validations come from uh, uh, performance. When we do well, we're good with ourselves. Our validation comes from uh, uh, performance, it comes from money, and it also comes from possessions. Yes. Amen. When you ain't got nothing, you don't feel like anything. Possessions do not constitute your validation. Possessions do not constitute who you are. Amen. But there's a lot of people, if you take their possessions away from them, they don't know who they are. Amen. And I've been to countries that didn't have much of anything, and they were some of the most secure individuals that I've ever met. Some of the most loving individuals that I've met. It's something, the more possessions we got, the more greedy we are. Yeah. Amen. I, you know, I have possessions and I'm sick of them. Why? Amen. Because, man, I got to clean them. <laughs> I got to maintain them. Look at this yard. I'm sick of being a slave to this yard. Why? Right? You know, I remember the days living in an apartment. It was just come home and that's it. You didn't have to do nothing. <laughs> right? But then, you know, we want the finer things in life. And nothing's wrong with that. Just don't let them have you. All right? Mother Teresa is a prime example of somebody who did not allow possessions to determine her character. You see, we are motivated either by character or personality. All right? Character is who you are. Personality is who people think you are based on what you have. Mother Teresa was not concerned about her reputation. Well, personality, I don't mean uh, uh, personality, I mean reputation. Your reputation is based on what people think you are. Character is who you really are, right? We live off our reputation more than we live off character, right? Mother Teresa was not concerned with her reputation. She was concerned about her character. There was a story that one time she uh, uh, was bandaging the wounds of a leper, Right. And uh, can you imagine the consensus that would have been taken if she should, you know, uh, uh, let, 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 let's vote whether we should uh, bandage the wounds of this leper. Well, I don't know, man. You can catch leprosy yourself. Let's search the scriptures and see what the scripture says. Oh, the scripture says be wise. So let's just toss them the bandages and let them put it on themselves. But she felt the call of God to put herself at risk. Amen. And she's one of the most famous women in this generation, right? Uh, 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 done many work, many, many more works than most men and women of God I've ever met, right? But she bandaged them, and there was this uh, rich man that was sitting there looking at her and told her, I wouldn't do that for a million dollars. And her response is, neither would I, but I would do it for Jesus. On, you see, your, 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 your character speaks volumes of who you are. It's your reputation can change from person to person to person, right? Uh, turn your Bibles to um, Matthew chapter 6 and, and starting at verse 19. It says, Do not store up for yourselves material measure, treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in to steal, but store yourselves up treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in to steal. For where your treasure is, there's where your heart will be. Your wishes, your desires, that on which your life centers will be also. She was not concerned about riches. She, was not, she lived in Calcutta, one of the poorest uh, places on the entire earth. Surrounded herself with nothing but poor people, but gave of her life because that's what her character was. 
It makes me wonder, why are so many men and women not living by character and we're living by reputation? Because we're victims to money. We're victims to, to, to seeking money. No matter how much money you get, I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to never be enough. You may think, well, if I just had a million dollars, I'd be okay. No, a million dollars is nowhere. It doesn't get you nowhere today. It doesn't get you nowhere much. Not for long. I don't want to devalue the million dollars, but it does, it's not what a million dollars was 20 years ago. Right? Money does not determine your value. Mother Teresa knew that. Her value was in her works that she did unto a living God. Society does not place very much uh, 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 emphasis on your character they put on the externals. What can you do for me? What can you do for, how can you further my plan? How can you further my company? And you know, they don't care if you're honest or not. True. Amen, your employer does not care if you're honest or not. You could be a dishonest dealer and he don't care. Right. It could be real estate, it could be car sales, it could be uh, 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 clothing, no matter what it is. You know, you tell them, well, I charge them $100 more. I guarantee you, nine times out of 10, your boss will high five you. He don't care that you cheated them. He don't care that you lied to them. All he cares about is the dollar bill. All he cares about is the profit. But a man of integrity will not go anywhere in that kind of world because it's, because it's a different system. We do not operate according to the world system. We're mandated by God to develop our character. And that's what bothers a lot of men and women about coming to church. I don't want to develop my character. I want to go to heaven, but I want to be who I am. I don't want to be controlled, manipulated, or dominated by either possessions, performance, or money. They are convenient. It's e Life is easier when you got money. There's no doubt about that. But do you have money or does money have you? The Bible says God blessed you that you could be what? A blessing. Some of us got money. We don't know how to bless. Come on, turn on somebody who's talking to you. How is your character? Most of us place reputation above character. And the Bible warns us about this. Over in the book of James, the second chapter, turn your Bibles there. How are you going to feel if some scrubby looking character came in here today and sat next to you? And if somebody come in here in an Armani suit and sat next to you? I remember I was in a revival one time and uh, there were some missionaries that were sitting right in front of me. I knew they were missionaries because they were all dressed in white and all that. And that's the way missionaries dress when they go to church. And uh, there was this guy that was obviously drunk sitting right behind them. And the preacher says, turn around and bless somebody. Shake their hand. And they turn around and looked at him with disgust. Because they, she, he did not meet their standard of, of acceptance. I, my heart dropped put my hands on his shoulders, I reached over and shake his hand, I said, God bless you, brother. Did that make me a better person? No, that made me understand character is more important than his reputation. They don't know who that man could have been. Amen. Amen. I wasn't always like that. I, you know, I had a, a, a gentleman come see me, a, a property I was trying to lease uh, at one time, and he came to uh, our, our program, and he was uh, sitting in, uh, outside my office waiting for me, and he was a scrubby looking character. He had a dirty t-shirt on, he had tennis shoes on, right? And I thought he was there to get help. And I, and I, asked, I asked the person that, that, that was there, I said, who's that? And they go, well, that's Walter Simons, the owner of Simons Brothers Gas Station. Wow. Now, if you're not from here, you don't know Simons Brothers Gas Station. They used to be all over, man. He was a very, very rich, wealthy individual, right? And I got convicted because I was judging him by what I saw. And the ch church and the world judges people by what they see, right. not their character, right? How many doors have been closed for you simply because somebody didn't like the way you looked? I've been invited to go preach based on a, uh, uh, a cassette that somebody heard. And when I got there, they saw this, and they put me in a room with all the uh, uh, secondary service, with all the uh, people with uh, life-addicting problems. They didn't put me in the main sanctuary because they judged me, they evaluated me based on what they heard, but they judged me based on what they saw. This is something that we need to overcome. You may think you've overcome it, but you still may be a victim to it. 
You still may be a victim to it. Will you give somebody a break in line that's well dressed before you give somebody a break in line that looks like that looks and smells? I have to tell myself consistently, consistently to guard my pride because that's only pride. That's only pride. What you see does not make up somebody. I learned a valuable lesson that day. He was a very wealthy man, but I was ready to judge him because he was dirty. I don't know where he came from. Don't know what he did. I went to a bank one time. I had a pair of coveralls on and a hat. And people used to wear coveralls, right? And uh, they ignored me. They would not wait on me. I had to, I had to speak up and say something for the, them to wait on me. And I had a pro- no problem with that. I went through it and did it. But the next day or the week or week later, I came back dressed in a suit. And it was the same people there. And they waited on me in a heartbeat. Yeah. Hi, sir. Can I help you? I, I got a problem. I spoke to the manager of the bank. It didn't go nowhere, but I was able to get it off my chest. We need to bring awareness to this, even if it goes nowhere. Yeah. We need to bring awareness to it, because the church is, 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 is prevalent with this. All right. How are you going to feel, again, if somebody comes in here and they got run-down tennis shoes, a dirty T-shirt, and they sit up front? We got a place for those people. It's in the back row, right? We are not supposed to judge anybody. You are being a victim to your own stinking thinking if you're judging somebody based on what they look like. You don't know what their character is. They may have a beautiful character. They may have, a, uh, uh, they, they may have more than you think they know if you just give them the opportunity. Book of James, chapter 2, starting verse 2. Let's read. For a person comes into your congregation whose hands are adorned with gold rings, who is wearing splendid apparel, and also a poor man in shabby clothes comes in. And you pay special attention. We don't just pay attention to him, we pay special attention. I want to thank God, Reverend so-and-so came in here today. To the one who wears this splendid clothes and say to him, sit here in this preferable seat, the best seat, while you tell the poor man, while you tell the poor man, stand there or sit there, on the floor at my feet. Are you not discriminating among yourselves, becoming critics and judging and judges with wrong motives? I like that he says, with wrong motives. Why did we give the preferable man, the, 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 the man preference? Because he looks like he has something to offer. Why did I not give that poor man preference? Because he's only here to take. We, become, we can become a, a victim of that kind of thinking and think that there's nothing wrong with it. Do you know how much love you give to somebody who's unlovable? They don't look like they have anybody. They don't look like they have anything. And if you just take a moment to say, hello, how are you? One of the most common uh, uh, phrases I hear out of working with homeless people is that nobody sees me. They look right through me. I make it a habit to say hello to them. I make it a habit to make eye contact with them. Say, we don't want to make eye contact. What if they ask me for a dollar? If you ain't got it, you ain't got it. But is a dollar going to break you? Right. Well, they might drink with it. It's not your business. Are you giving them a dollar right. with, it, with the restrictions, go get McDonald's? Right. I say all the time, if I feel inclined to give, I will give. If I don't feel the Spirit lead me, I don't give. And, and I, some, there's been some times I've given more than a dollar. And I've told them, and I knew it's enough to go get drunk on. Because I used to know people that did those things. I know the prices of those things. And I would tell them, I said, look, I'm going to give this to you. I says, I don't care what you go do with it, but I prefer you buy food. I prefer you don't get drunk, but it's your choice. I've had a few of them tell me that they were very grateful and thankful that I even said that. People need to know that you care. Amen. They don't care about your Bible knowledge. They need to know that you care. Right? And, 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 you know, I want to minister to people's hearts, not their wallets. Amen. What are you ministering to? Are you a victim to your own thinking? You see, our thinking has not been completely transformed. We still hold opinions that are contrary to God. And we can be a victim to that thinking we're okay. I'm okay because I sing praises. I'm okay because I give my money. I'm okay because I'm of service. Yeah, but if you're preferring this man over this man, the Bible says you are not okay. There's something wrong with you. 
They are not, their life is not the sum total of what they have. The problem with this is that most, most of society thinks this way. This is why people are wanting what everybody else has. Because I must have, not have any value unless I got a big screen TV. I must not have any value. You go over to somebody's house, got a box TV, and you're going to watch TV with them, I guarantee you they're going to say something about their box TV. They don't have to say nothing about their box TV. When you come over to my house, you eat on paper plates. You could judge me if you want to. But I'm not going to pull out no plate and wash a plate for you to eat a meal that is just as good on a paper plate. I'm not trying to impress you. Well, our, 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 our victim mindset causes us to perform all the time. We always have to be on. You're always smiling. Hey, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And, and inward, you're hurting. Amen, but, but I have to let people know that I'm performing. Yes. I have to let people know that I'm okay. Right. What is wrong with letting somebody know you need prayer? What's wrong with letting somebody know that you're not okay? They might reject me. They may not like me. Well, guess what? Pastor Mike needs prayer. I'm not okay. I'm blessed, but I'm not okay all the time. Every Sunday I've been here, I put the key in the church door. I'm okay putting the key in the church door, but I'm not okay looking behind my back to see if there's somebody behind me. Not somebody, the police. Right? I needed your prayers. Is there something wrong saying that? Well, I want to, well, God bless you. You get what you want. Amen. Victors do not feel that they have to perform all the time. You don't have to be kind all the time if you don't want to be kind. You have to be nice. There's a difference between being nice and being kind. Being nice is bringing Brother Charlie a cup of coffee. Being kind is bringing him the sugar and the cream with it. How many follow that? Hey Amen. Hey, I'm going to take care of you. You want cream and sugar? It's over there, bro. Get it yourself. I'm done serving. I brought you the coffee. That's enough. I know Rachel's going to use that. Victors know their value. Victors know their value. Do you know your value? Is your value based on your pocketbook? Is your value based on your possessions? Is your value placed on your, uh, 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 on your money? What happens when you don't have money? What happens when you don't have possessions? What happens when you can't perform? You still need to know that you have worth. Amen. You still need to know that you are valuable. You still need to know that you are okay. Yes. I'm okay in a little one-room shack as I, as I am in a house. Right? What I have does not, or what I don't have does not change me because it does not make me. I am, my character dictates who I am. Let us not get caught up in, in, in getting value from things. They, because you know what happened? The Bible says it's going to rust, rust, rust. moth's going to eat it, and it's going to rot away. You know, when you got a brand new car, oh, it feels good, huh? And that leather, oh, that leather smells so good, Right? And the first payment comes, it still smells good. But all of a sudden, I don't have that new car smell no more. And you don't feel so good about getting in that car. That, that, that car, that little possession, was validating who you are. You should feel good getting in a hoopty. Because you ain't walking. Come on. <laughs> and if you don't have a hoopty, you ought to be glad you're getting called Uber. Because you ain't walking. But the bigger our car is, the more value we have. The more possessions we have, the better we think of ourselves because they validate us. Turn your Bibles over to the book of Luke, chapter 4. Victors know their value and they understand that their value is not based on their performance. I don't need to do things to show you who I am. I don't need to perform to validate myself. I can do that if I want to, but I'm choosing not to. The Bible says that Jesus was a man just like us. He went through the same temptations, the same trials, the same problems that you and I have and overcame them. It is a temptation to perform all the time. All right? Especially for preachers. They think they have to hit a home run every single time they get in the pulpit. You're not going to do that all the time. Sometimes you're going to preach a dud. Sometimes the people, you hit a home run and people are responding going to make you feel like you preached a dud. 
Singers feel like they need to perform all the time. I get up here and do what I got to do because I got to do it. Whether it's accepted or not is not my problem. I'm not trying to prove anything behind my preaching. Yeah. It wasn't the case all the time. I had to be on because that's who I was. And then I realized my preaching doesn't make me. Right. My character makes me. Are you hiding behind the word of God because you think the word of God? See, here's what happens. We use the word of God and we speak only the word of God to people. We criticize or, or, or correct people with the word of God and we hide our stinky personality behind it. Take the word of God out and all of a sudden the real you starts coming out. So all we do is speak Bible to one another. Because if I don't speak Bible to you, you're going to see my flaws. If I don't speak Bible to you, you're going to see how insecure I really am. If I don't speak Bible to you, you're going to see how threatened I am by your presence. So I'm going to correct you with the word of God only. People bother me that only talk Christianese. Because I know you don't talk Christianese in your home with your husband or your wife or your children. Dost thou clean our room today? We don't do that, man. We've so got all this Christianese talk. You know, uh, I didn't do it. Oh, bless the Lord. You forgot to bring home the milk, honey. That's okay. No, you're going to be cussing him out. Because you told him three times to bring it. But you don't have to hide behind the word when you're at home. You don't have to perform and hide around the word when you're around people. I don't know why we as Christians think it's not okay to talk about things that are outside of the Bible. Yeah. You know when I stop talking about things outside the Bible? When I'm not on this earth to enjoy it no more. As long as I'm here, I can enjoy talking about world events. I can enjoy talking about going places. It doesn't always have to be the Bible, but the word is always in, interjected in there. But I'm not trying to perform. Those of you that like to always speak the word and the word only, why are you doing it? Why are you doing it? Are you performing? Are you trying to show somebody how much word level you have because you want to be validated? Oh my God, that brother, that sister, they know the word. I love talking to them because they feed my soul. Something's wrong with that. Because you're setting a standard that uh, you expect everybody else to follow and insecure people will follow it and they never get delivered and you've got insecure people trying to minister to one another and nobody's getting ministered to. They're using the word only. You see, when you're free, you don't need to speak the word every single time you're talking to somebody. You may be speaking the word, but you're not quoting the word. I'm talking about people that got, well, you know, the Bible says. I mean, have, have, have you ever went to the store with somebody and all they do is talk about the word? And they say, gee, should I, get, uh, 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 should I get bread or should I get, or, or, sh or should I get hot dogs? And they say, you know, the Bible says, man, shall not live by bread alone. <laughs> talk about a loaf of bread, brother. Come on, you know there's people out, out there like that. I didn't say it here. Out there like that. <laughs> Luke chapter 4. Let's see how Jesus handled that. Amen. When the enemy tried to get him to perform. Now Jesus, full and, and in perfect communication with the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. I love that right there. Not every problem you have is of the enemy. God will lead you into a dry place. God will lead you into the desert. God will lead you someplace to find out what you are made of. You don't have to be rebuking the enemy all the time. Sometimes it's God that took you there. For 40 days being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during, during those days. And when he's ended, he was hungry. The devil said unto him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to what? Be turned to bread. If you're the son of God, perform. If you're the son of God, prove it. If you're the son of God, show me and I'll believe you're the son of God. If you're really a minister, speak the word. If you're really a Christian, tell us something good. I don't got to tell people anything about God, the Bible, or church for them to know I'm different. I don't need to declare it to prove it. I don't need to wear a shirt that says Jesus saves to prove it. I'm not trying to prove anything. Be who you are and people will see who you are. I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm a hypocrite. I'm a backstabber. 
But I'm going to hide all that with the Word of God. I, you know, the word, I was reading my Bible yesterday, and the Word spoke to me. Well, how come he didn't speak to you about your lying, your backstabbing, and your hip hypocrisy? <laughs> Always feel a need to perform, especially perfectionists. I know I want to hide right now. You are performing. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to miss the mark. It's okay not to meet your standard as you think all the time. But if I'm not the perfectionist, people are going to think less of me. Jesus could care less whether the enemy thought he was the son of God or not. It did not devalue him because he didn't perform. See, I'm not devalued when you come in my house and you see dust and dirt somewhere. I'm not devalued, or neither is my wife devalued, when you come over you see clutter somewhere. Why are you so highly valued? Because your house looks like a museum. Your house looks like nobody lived in it. Amen. You mean to tell me people live in a house and there's no dust, there's no dirt, nothing's out of place? Yes, something's wrong with them. Just my opinion. That's just my opinion. Right? I'd rather go over somebody's cluttered house and feel comfortable and drink a cup of coffee and fellowship with them than sit in somebody's house that's uncomfortable. I should know, should I put this on the table? There's no, there, there's no coaster there. What do I do with this? I want to be at the place that knows their value. They ain't got to perform, man. You know, they're not going to pull out all the best stuff and perform and show me, you know, see how valuable I am? You're heating on fine china. Go to Pastor's house, you read on Chinette. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Go to John 6. Amen. Starting at verse 29. John chapter 6, verse 29. Let's read. Jesus replied, This is the work, the service that God asks of you, that you believe in the one whom he has sent that you cleave to, trust to, rely on, and have faith in his messengers. Wherefore they said unto him, What sign, what miracle, wonderful work will you perform so that we may see it and believe and rely and adhere to you? What supernatural work have you to show what you can do? They were baiting him to perform again. People are consistently baiting you to perform. Whether it's your knowledge of the word or your testimony. Your testimony. Everybody wants to hear your nasty testimony. My testimony, let me share something with you. I don't perform with my testimony. You know what what performing with your testimony is? You're a trick dog. Performing tricks for your audience so they can see what they think is the goodness of God. You see, the goodness of God is, uh, uh, brought me out of what I was in. Yes, yes. He did not bring me out of what I was in to keep reliving it. Yes, yes. I don't need to perform that over and over and over again to show the goodness of God. I am who I am because of his goodness. I don't perform, I live. Yes. I get so tired. Let's well, just share your testimony. You want to hear my testimony? God moved in the miraculous. God moves every Sunday in the miraculous. People are being risen up. People are being delivered. People are being transformed by the power of God. Know your testimony. That is my testimony. My testimony is not who I was. My testimony is who I am. Some of us need to close our door, uh, close the door on who you was and start believing who you were and stop performing uh, because somebody snapped their finger and said, tell us what God brought you out of. No, I will tell you what God brought me out of if it's pertinent and necessary and I will listen to the Holy Spirit and I will do it at that time. Until then, you're going to hear what the goodness of the Lord has been doing. Not what he's done, what he's been doing. We get caught up in performing our testimony. We've got service today that still have, you know, I want to, we're going to lift up this mic. I'm going to have, oh, brother so-and-so, please come give your testimony. Wait well, you know, 25 years ago, God delivered me from. <laughs> Sister, you want to come? Show? Yeah. 50 years ago, God set me free. What's he done 50 years? What's he done 25 years? You mean he just brought you out and dropped you there? 
Stop performing for the circus clowns. Stop performing. They want to say, show us what sign so that we believe in you. Oh, I believe God delivered you because you told me again. No, let me see who you are now, not who you were. Stop performing because it doesn't validate who you are. What I came out of has nothing to do with who I am. You can't be where I'm at, coming from where, and holding on to what you came out of. The Bible tells me to, to forget the past, let it go. I'm not bringing up the past, I'm going to perform it over and over and over and over again because it doesn't validate who I am. My performance has nothing to do with it. And people will try to bait you. Show me that you're truly delivered. Tell me what you came out of. Refuse to perform because it doesn't validate who you are. Victors don't need possessions. We may want them, but we don't need them. You know what I mean by need? I gotta have it. I gotta have it. I went over to Brother Charlie's house. He got himself a big TV. I mean, bigger than mine. I sat there, I looked at it, I go, whoa, I could read this without squinting, man. I like this TV. I went home and I looked at my TV. I go, look at this thing. <laughs> I mean, it's a big screen TV too, you know, respectable. Yeah. <laughs> I go, I don't like this. And it started flickering. And watch, it goes black. Then the TV comes back in, it goes black. I called Charlie up and started talking. Hey, my TV did that too. Go, yeah, it's going to go out and get a big TV. <laughs> so... I'm waiting for it to go out. <laughs> but I don't need it to validate who I am. I don't need that possession because I remember watching the TV this big. Yeah. Amen. It did not change who I am. And when this TV goes out, I'm going to get that big TV. <laughs> Actually, to be honest with you, I, sa I, <laughs> I sent him a text of a picture uh, of a TV on sale. And he goes, that's one inch bigger than mine. I went, yeah. <laughs> The Holy Spirit corrected me right there. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Turn your Bible to Luke chapter 4. Oh, we're there. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, we're still in, we're, I'm talking about performance, huh? Then he said to Jesus, led him to a high mountain, displayed before him all the kingdom of the inhabited earth and the magnificence in the twinkling of an eye. And the devil said to him, I will give you this realm and all of its glory, its power, its renown, because he has handed it over to me. The enemy spoke the truth at that time. It was his. It was handed over to him. I will give it to you whatever you wish. I will give it to whomever I want. You know what he's telling Jesus? He says, I'll give you all the possessions. I'll give you everything if you just bow down and worship me. I'll give you the big screen TV. I'll give you the big house. I'll give you the big car at the cost. The cost is called worship. People that are victors do not worship their possessions. Possessions are nice. They can make life more comfortable. But are you worshiping the blessings that God gave you? Or are you enjoying them and blessing others with them? He took Jesus up. He says, look at this whole world. I'll give it to you. Little did he understand that Jesus knew who he was. He wasn't even tempted he knew that his father owned it all. He says, ah, I'm not going to worship and bow down. What are you saying? I'm not going to worship and bow down to you or these possessions. How many of us worship our possessions more than we worship the king? You may not think you do. But you're out there and you're shining that motorcycle and you're shining your car and you don't shine your spirit in prayer. You're not shining your spirit, taking care of your spirit, reading the word or transforming your character, you are bowing down to that motorcycle, that car, or your house. 
You spend five hours a day cleaning your house, making sure everything is spotless, nothing gets in your, misses you. Clean under the bed every day. Just neat freaks like that. You're worshiping that house, and you spend 20 minutes in prayer? You're bowing down to your possessions. Now, we're too sophisticated to get out of our car and say, oh, thank you, mighty Chevy, you got me to my destination. But we'll sit in there and we'll vacuum under the seat, get in the vents, we'll wax the leather, we'll wax the exterior, we'll clean the windows, we'll do the tires, we'll do everything. And then go to bed. No mention of God, no talking to God, but you spent much time, and you could, you could, you, you, you could say you're, you're talking to your vehicle when you're rubbing it. <laughs> you're talking to your vehicle when you're cleaning it. But do you talk to God? Do you spend time with God? No, because that material possession defines who you are. Victors are not subject to possessions. Possessions have a way of calling you. You don't think so? Don't, cl- don't clean your backyard. Amen. You open up that backyard, oh my God, I got to go out there and clean. You know what I'm saying? I've been calling you. The weeds are growing. The weeds are saying, take care of me. All right? If I don't clean my backyard every two days, I can't believe how, I don't, I can't believe how messy one dog can make a backyard. <laughs> I would open the door and say, I, you know, I, I, I talk to my dog. <laughs> I can't believe you did this. And every day I look out there, it's calling me. You better get out here and clean it because you know it's going to get worse. But I make sure I spend that quality time with the Lord as well. Because I don't want that backyard to become my God. Victors are not controlled by their possessions. What's controlling you? Have you become a victim to your possessions? Have you become a victor, a, 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 a victim to performing all the time? You know, a victim to performing... And, you know, I got to be kind, I got to be nice, I got to be gentle, I, I can't show any humanity whatsoever. Yeah. Oh, I can't believe you got angry. The Bible says be angry and sin not. Learn how to control your anger. Yeah. Ain't nothing wrong with being angry. Yeah. It's how you handle that anger. Yeah. I'm not put up with it. That's the wrong kind of anger. That's intimidation. Yeah. That's violent. You could be angry and sin not. That's what the word says. If you, could, if you can't express your anger, the Bible would have said, I forbid anger. Right, right. It says, be angry. There's some things we should be angry about. Right, right, right. If you're the only one cleaning the house, nobody helps. Amen. You got six people living there. Yes. You should be angry. <laughs> but how you express that anger determines if you are a victim to that or not. Look, I don't know how many times I have to say this. I am not. I am not going to keep telling you. I'm not going to raise my voice. I'm not going to get angry. I'm just going to take the door off your bedroom. I'm going to take the light bulbs out of your room until you comply. Those are corrective measures that work. Smacking somebody up the, upside the head don't work. Some of y'all need to learn that. Well, reasoning don't work either. Well, taking a door that teenagers want their privacy works wonders. Take the door off and stand in the doorway. Once a privacy, you got no privacy coming to you help clean this house. So I'm going to tell you, teenager, I'm taking your door, honey. <laughs> Worshipping things can destroy you. Having too much pride in what you own can destroy you. You know, I, I'm glad I could talk like that and the teenagers should still love me. Amen. Turn your Bible to the book of Daniel, chapter 4. Hallelujah. You know, we do, there's nothing wrong, you know, with, with having pride. The Bible says that we shouldn't think of ourselves more highly than we should. Right? Uh, um, I take pride in what I have, but I'm not looking at it as the be all, end all of my life. All right? I am more than my possessions. You are more than your possessions. 
And to take an inordinate pride over that, it can destroy your character. Not your reputation, your character. People know you because of what you have. They should know you because of who you are, right? I'm kind, I'm gentle, I'm compassionate, I'm a good listener, on and on and on. Not behind your performance, right? I, you know, I'm friends with so-and-so because he can fix cars. I'm friends with so-and-so because he can fix houses. I'm friends with so-and-so because, no, are you friends with them because of their character? It's hard to be friends with somebody with their, because of their character because not pe- many people want to build their character. Are you trustworthy? Are you faithful? Are you respectable? Are you kind? That's who I want to be around. I don't want to be around somebody cantankerous, nasty, and, and, and an attitude and doesn't like anybody, right. right? Only like three people, four people, and that's it. Right? Get over it. Yeah. Get over it. Your feelings are going to get hurt in life. Yeah. You're going to be disappointed in life. But your character does not allow you to change. Your character, if it's touched by God and you surrendered it, does not allow you to repay evil for evil. Right. You don't allow somebody to change who you are. Well, I'm not going to be a sucker. Well, God don't want you to be a sucker. He wants you to be a fool. It's a difference. Paul said, I'm a fool for Christ's sake. Who are you? Whose fool are you? Right? And if you say, well, well, I just, you know, you're a fool of the devil. I'd rather be a fool for God than a fool for the devil. Right? So let's read. Possessions, if you're taking too much pride in them, can destroy you. Actually, Nebuchadnezzar was even warned. There was a prophecy that came to him and told him if he didn't repent, if he didn't change his mind, that this is going to happen. Yeah. See, when you got pride in what you own, you think you're untouchable. Yeah. The Bible says in the last days, everything that be shaken is going to be shaken. Yeah. There's millionaires that are losing their fortune behind this. Yeah. Right? They own property after property after property and they're not getting no rent. Yeah. And guess what? The banks don't care. The banks still want their rent. So they're holding something of value that they have no value with because all things th- thing can be shaken, be shaken. They've been warned through the word. They've been warned through the scriptures. They've been warned through prophecies, right? The preachers have been preaching for uh, you know, hundreds of years about the economy and people turning away from God. They turn a deaf ear to it and they take pride in the fact that they have great possessions. Nebuchadnezzar took pride in the fact he had great possessions that he did, he got. God didn't give it to him, he got it. Let's read. And this was fulfilled, the prophecy was fulfilled, and came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking in the royal palace of Babylon. The king said, is this not the great Babylon that I have built? As the royal residence and seat of the government? By the, mighty, by the might of my power and for the honor and glory of my majesty. See all that I've done. See all that I have. See all that I built. See the splendor. See how glorious this is. That I've done for my might. That I've done so that I could feel important. That I've done so I could feel like I'm somebody. I got this six bedroom house and it's just me and my wife. But I want to feel important. Come on, talk to me. I got all this money in the bank that, that, that I could be a blessing, but I want to feel important, so I don't want to let any of it go. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it was spoken. In other words, you was told, you was told, the kingdom is departed from thee, and, that very, and they shall drive thee from men, and thou shalt dwell in shall be with the beasts of the field, and, they shall, and you shall eat grass like, as an animal. And seven times shall pass over thee until thou know the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men. He said, you know, I'm stripping you of everything. You're going to be in the, in, the, in the wilderness like a wild animal until you understand that I'm God. Until you understand that I gave you those possessions. Until you understand it was my favor and not your might. See, here's what happened when we're our trust and our confidence and our validation is the things that we own, we think we got it on our own. You, what you got is only of God. Amen. You may have pushed doors open. You may have this degree that gets you that thing or the other thing, but it was only the grace of God that gave it to you. 
I can take no credit in anything else that I ministry has done, anything I have, because it was only God. But when you are validated by what you have, you take pride in what you have because you think you got it. God gave it to you, my friend. You are just a steward over it. Amen. I got that six-bedroom house, and this family needs help, and nobody's in my other five bedrooms. I turn a deaf ear. No, don't get me wrong. I'm not telling you to take anybody in your home, but what if the Holy Spirit told you? Hello? What if the Holy Spirit spoke to your heart? What if the Holy Spirit spoke to your heart and told you to give a possession away? You know, I was feeling guilty about the cars that I own and until the Holy Spirit dealt with me that I've given cars away. And the Bible says, give and it'll be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Amen. With the same measure, in other words, the same thing will come back to you, right? God blessed you so that you could be a blessing. He did not bless you so you could take pride in it that look what I got. Look who I am. Look at my gold, look at my silver, look at my clothes. I'm somebody. They do not make you. You are who you are because God created you. And when we live outside of who we are in God, we have to start looking for something to validate who we are. And when you look into those things to validate who you are, more than likely, you're scared, insecure, and threatened. So you've got to cover that all up with possessions, with performance, yes. Yes. and with money. True. Amen. You, you ever see a, 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 somebody that has a lot of money, all right, and they go to pay for something, they pull out their wad. <laughs> they pull out their wad, all right? Somebody who's wise, you know, they, they'll, you know, dig in their pocket. They know what they got, and they'll pull out a bill. They'll not pull out their wad. But somebody trying to impress you will pull out their wad. Even in the day of plastic, they will still pull out their wad because money validates them. And you could be somebody here today without a penny in your account and still have the love of money. Money doesn't, because you have a lot of money doesn't mean you love it. You could be guilty of the love of money when you don't have a penny. The Bible says money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. Money can keep you from fulfilling God's plan. Money can keep you from, from being, uh, having a life of fulfillment. Money answers things for sure. You could take vacations. You could buy things. But it's nothing to be worshipped. It doesn't validate who you are. You should be the same kind, generous, thankful person you are without a penny, as you are with money. Here's the thing with love of money. If you're stingy when you're broke, you can be stingy when you got some money. Well, I'll give my tithes when I get this much. No, you won't. You think you're going to give your tithes on $200 a week when you're making $20,000 a month? No, you can't. Because you're guilty of the love of money because it's validating who you are. Victors overcome that. Victors are not controlled by their bank account. Turn your Bibles over to um, Luke chapter 12. We don't need money to validate us. And let's read from 15 to 20. Hallelujah. And he said unto them, Guard yourselves and keep yourselves free from covetousness, the immoderate desire of, for wealth. Our culture doesn't push us to have a comfortable, peaceful life. It pushes us to keep wanting more. Yeah. Amen. You got a nice home. But that's not enough. I want a bigger home. You know, there's one couple. I got, I, I got to show going to probably be embarrassed, but I got to say it. Rick and Linda, they bless me. They're realtors. They have their own brokerage firm. firm. For how many years? 50 years. Successful at it. All the business people that they started with got homes in Black Hawk and every place else. They still live in San Lorenzo. San Leandro. Ooh, worse. 
<laughs> in the same house their children were raised in. They realize their possessions and their money don't validate them. Their character does. I have to use that because to me it's a prime example that it can be done. Why are you so hung up on bigger and better? Coming from a man who wants a one-inch TV bigger than Charlie. <laughs> I didn't know it was one-inch bigger, but when he said that, it done something, to, to, something here. Amen. Let's read. The greedy longing to have more, for a man's life does not what? Consist in the things that he has. The greedy, uh, overflowing abundance of the which is over and above his needs. Over and above his needs. Over and above his needs. You got a 15 person couch and only three people live in that house. And you don't fellowship. <laughs> then he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man was fertile and yielded plenty for it. And he considered and debated within himself, what shall I do? I have no place in which to gather together my harvest. And he said, I know what I'll do. I'll pull down my storehouses. I'll build larger ones. And he said, the Bible says, and God spoke to him and said, tonight, this, you fool, your soul will be required of you. Your life is much more than what the air we're breathing today. Our life is much more than what we can see. You're designed by God to live in eternity. And the Bible says if, in Colossians chapter 3, if you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where moth, moth and rust does not corrupt. Possessions are nice. Money's good. But it does not make up the character of you. But we are victims to that because it's on the TV, it's on our media, it's, it, it's, it, it, it's, it, it's with our friends. She, she shared with me, uh, how many times your friends have told you when you're going to buy a bigger house, when you're going to move. Come on, you need, come on, you're going to need to show your success. You need to show somebody that you're somebody. I don't need to show nobody. I, well, you know, what, you know what her and her husband said? We do not need to perform. We're comfortable where we are at. It's interesting, man. You know, let, let's go back over the history and think in your mind, those of you that have been here for a while, how many men and women have come through here and prospered and moved on and up? I'm not going to live here in Hayward now. I'm moving to Dublin. Right. Right. Ain't much different than Hayward. I'm going to move to Tracy. I'm going to buy me a home out there. And the justifications are only justifications to do what they wanted to do because they're hung up on bigger and better. Again, we're tempted to that through the media, through TV, through friends, through family. Oh, you're still living here? I can't believe you're still living here. You're doing so much, but you should be living up here on the hill with us. Remember, I don't like the people that live on the hill. Matthew chapter 19. Hallelujah, verse 21, let's read. Jesus answered, a man came to Jesus and said, Jesus, he said, he said what must I do uh, 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 to be saved? How can, I, how can I follow you? How can I enjoy the riches of God? Jesus answered him, he said, if you would be perfect, that is, ha that is to have that spiritual maturity which accompanies uh, uh, self-sacrificing character, go and sell what you have. What are you going to do if Jesus told you to go sell what you have? Now here's somebody that is stuck on wealth and give to the poor. Now I know the other translations of the King James Version that I chose to use because it's true. All right? He didn't say give everything to the poor. He said go, you do not have a habit of giving anything. He said sell what you got and give to the poor. 10%, 20%, 50%, didn't matter. It was up to him because the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver and we should give according to our heart, according to the measure. Jesus told him that. And because he had much riches, the Bible says the man walked away sorrowfully. Jesus never demanded or commanded him to give, to sell what he had and to give it all away. 
But here's what happens when you're trusting in your riches. Any amount you give away is considered a loss. I can't afford to lose 20%. I can't lose to lose 30%. I can't afford to give this to that person. I can't afford to buy that. Do you know sometimes the wealthiest people are the most stingiest? Amen. You know, I, I can't think. Every time I went to the Philippines, man, I always got the best of whatever they had. Amen. And not just them, their neighbors would come over with dishes. And we would eat. And you go over to somebody else's house and they give you a six-ounce portion of this, a two-ounce portion of that. <laughs> Why is that? I want more for later. He was greedy. He had much wealth. And Jesus said, it's easier for a rich man to go through the eye of a needle than to enter the kingdom. Now, the eye of a needle was in, in, in the biblical days that there was, you know, uh, bands of thieves, hundreds at a time, roaming the desert on camels. What a gang. <laughs> oh, the camel jockeys, man. <laughs> and they would build a town and they would build an arch so that anybody wanted to come into the town at night, they would shut the town up. And so the camel jockeys couldn't just raid the town. They had to come to the town and they had to unload their camel and the, the eye of the needle, that's what they called the arch, was just big enough for a camel for you to unload your camel and the camel would literally crawl on his knees to go through the eye of the needle. And Jesus said it's easier for a camel to do that than a rich man to enter heaven because the rich man trusted in his riches. Are you trusting in your bank account? The more zeros you've got with a number behind it, the happier you are? Riches do not validate who you are. Victims succumb to performing all the time. Victims succumb to uh, uh, their uh, finances all the time. Victims succumb to the uh, possessions that they own. Not a victor. A victor's free from those things. They realize that they are stewards over them and they're accountable to God for it. Now, if you have nice things, you're supposed to take care of nice things because it's not yours. It's the Lord's. But are you worshiping it or are you spending the same amount of time with him? You are validated because you're a wonderful human being. That's hard for us to understand. You're not wonderful because you own things. You're not wonderful because of money. You're not wonderful because you could do something great. You're wonderful because God created you. That's hard to understand because when we look at ourselves in the mirror, we see the wrinkles, we see the rolls, we see the pimples, we see the flaws. This is wonderful, yes. The stretch marks, yes. Wonderful. Why? Because God created you. Wonderful. So when you look at somebody with disdain because of what, they, what you see, you're showing your character. Because you ought to be looking at one another as a child, and a, a, a man and woman of God. Wonderfully made in his image. Turn your Bibles to Psalms 139, verse 14. Let's read. I will confess and praise you for you are fearful and wonderful and for that awful wonder of my birth. Wonderful are your works, or I'm your work. I'm wonderful. And that my inner self, I love that, my inner self knows that I don't have to convince myself that I'm good. I know that I'm good. Not because I've got something, but because I'm wonderfully made by his hand. My inner man knows it. I don't need to walk around and tell myself I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. When I look at the stretch mark, when I look at the rolls, when I look at the flaws, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You may have to pick it up, but you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. Victors. Keep on walking. Victors don't allow what somebody says to deter them. They keep on walking. Victors walk away. Victims stand and argue. Victims stand and debate. Victors wash their hands and move on. A lot of people got a problem with this. We don't need to justify. We don't need to explain our position with anybody. Why? Because I'm a victor. You don't understand. That's your problem. 
I'm moving on. You want to stay stuck there? That's your problem, but I'm moving on. Go, go over to Luke chapter 9. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Starting in verse 1. Now Jesus called together the twelve disciples and gave them the right to exercise power and authority over all demons to heal diseases. Then he sent them out on a brief journey to preach the kingdom of God and to perform healing. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey that might be, succumb you, neither a walking stick nor bag nor bread nor money. I don't want you to be bound by possessions. I don't want you to be bound by money. I don't want you to be bound by performance. I will supply your needs. Wherever house you enter, say unto thee uh, 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 that you leave that city or go to another. And for all those who do not welcome you, when you leave that city, go back and explain to them what your intention was. Go back and explain to them what your need was. He goes, no, wipe the dust off your feet. In other words, keep on walking. Amen. You see, when somebody says, well, you offended me, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. That should have been enough right there. And they will bait you to victimize you, to explain to you, to control you. That's right. Amen. And what Jesus was saying, he says, don't be controlled by feeling the need for people to like you all the time. Because no matter what you do, some people ain't going to like you. Amen. 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 No matter what you do, you got to perform for them all the time. Stop feeling the need to perform. There's just some people you need to turn your back on, wipe your feet, and keep on walking. Because that's what victors do. We walk away from a problem. You don't sit there and fight the problem. You don't debate the problem. You don't argue the problem. You don't have to justify yourself. You don't have to explain yourself because they are already opinionated against you. Don't be a victim to that. Jesus said, wipe the dust off your feet. But when you got a nasty attitude about it yourself, you're still a victim. I didn't need you anyway. No, my heart breaks when I have to walk away from people. It is never a good feeling. I wish it didn't have to be this way. I wish we could still communicate. I wish we could still worship together. But you're not going to put me in bondage by your insecurities and your fears. I'm going to worship the Lord anyway. I'm going to praise the Lord anyway. I'm going to wipe my feet and I'm going to keep on going. That's what a victor does. So who are you, control, who's allow, who are you allowing to control you? Is it somebody or is it money? Is it possessions? Is it performance? Do you feel you have to perform all the time? Do you, do you got to run around with a smile on your face all the time? I don't know how people do that. Right. And I know there's people that do that. Man, I'm, hey, hallelujah. I don't trust people that smile all the time. You don't have to say a word, but all you do is run around with a smile on your face. You know, like the Chelsea cat, you got something to hide, man. You're trying to pull my guard down, so it's even up more. Yes. Did you learn anything? Come on, let's give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah.